Trevor Aronson joins us. He is the director of the Florida Center for Investigative Reporting, the author of The Terror Factory, Inside the FBI's Manufactured War on Terrorism, the producer of documentaries such as Al Jazeera's Informants, and an investigative journalist for outlets such as The Intercept. He has won numerous awards for his work and has given an excellent TED Talk on the subject. Good to have you with us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Now, I recently taught a university course on 9-11 and terrorism and used your book as reading material. I've got the Kindle version uh, here. And I was reminded of your work last week when I read two separate stories, which we'll talk about. The first of a man who purchased a machine gun from FBI informants who urged him to carry out a mass shooting. And the second, a man who attempted to hire an FBI agent undercover to carry out a hit. This terror circus just never seems to stop. But before we get into those details, most people that we know, friends and family, tend to believe the daily news cycle and the constant threat of terrorism that the government warns us about, which in turn makes us fearful of each other, public spaces, uh, airports, and so on. But people don't seem to be aware of the deceitful nature of the terror threats issued by our governments, which you call the terror factory. It seems that more than 50%, you can correct me if I'm wrong, of terror threats or cases are actually manufactured by the government itself, carried out by agent provocateurs, that the FBI is the single organization responsible for hatching and financing more terrorist plots in the USA than any other organization, including Al Qaeda. And you cite one defendant's lawyer who stated that the FBI are creating crimes to solve crimes so they can claim victory in the war on terror. So could you please to start, give us a quick synopsis of what is the terror factory and the true nature of the threat of terrorism to the public? Of course, yeah. So, I mean, to, to, to address one thing, obviously there is a threat of terrorism in the United States and elsewhere. Um, right now, the threat of terrorism in the United States is probably lower than it would be in, say, Europe. But still, the threat of terrorism, including from um, Muslim terrorists, is a real thing. Um, what's happened in the United States, however, since 9-11 has been a very proactive uh, response by, by law enforcement to try to stop the next attack. So, so in, in kind of a quick history, after 9-11, you know, the FBI realized that it had been caught fairly flat-footed, that there had been a number of intelligence sharing failures that had resulted in the FBI and other law enforcement agencies not being able to stop the 9-11 hijackers before they, you know, did what they did. And so George W. Bush, the then President of the United States, told Robert Mueller, who was then the FBI director, you know, never again. It became kind of the never again directive where the FBI was told to stop the next attack. And what that meant was that the FBI, which, you know, had previously not had a lot of intelligence in Muslim communities around the country, um, perceived Muslims to be the number one threat of terrorism, in, in large part because 9-11 was so successful. It's important to remember how shockingly um, destructive and, and lethal the 9-11 attacks were. Um, but in reality, we now know, looking back these 16 years later, that, that what that was a result of was the fact that al-Qaeda in many ways got incredibly lucky um, on 9-11 to have a, an attack more devastating than they probably would have even predicted they would have. That said, though, in the moment, in the immediate days after 9-11, because that attack was so successful, there was a perception from within law enforcement that there were other such cells all around the country waiting to attack. And the goal of the FBI was to stop those cells. Um, as we will later find out, there really weren't the cells that the FBI suspected there were. And due to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, groups like Al Qaeda were unable to you know, export terrorists the way that they did on 9-11. So the FBI became hugely concerned with the so-called lone wolves, people who are already in the United States who watch some Al Qaeda propaganda or now ISIS propaganda and go about on, you know, attacks on their own. And so the FBI, through a preemptive policy, it recruited thousands of informants from within Muslim communities and tried to find people who were interested in getting involved in this sort of attack. So, you know, at, in its truest form, what the FBI is trying to do is stop people like the Boston Marathon bombers or the um, Omar Mateen, the man who killed, um, you know, dozens of people at the Orlando nightclub last year, try to get those people before they strike. Um, what the FBI is ultimately doing, though, is instead through 
sting operations where undercover agents or informants pose as members of terrorist organizations and try to find would-be terrorists instead of finding the truly dangerous guys like the the Boston Marathon bombers or, or the Orlando shooter, in large part what they're finding are people who are mentally ill or economically desperate. And these are people that the FBI is able to manipulate through terrorist sting, terrorism stings by providing the means and the opportunity. Um, so as a general example, uh, you know, there was a case in uh, upstate New York a couple of years ago involving a man named Emmanuel Lutschman. Um, this was a guy who was known around Rochester, New York as as being the crazy guy on the corner, you know, he had no money, he was homeless, and he was long suspected to be mentally ill. He meets uh, an FBI informant and expresses his desire to, you know, carry out an attack for ISIS. Um, well, of course, being homeless and being broke and having no weapons, you know, he was a threat probably to no more than himself. Um, yet the FBI, through an elaborate terrorism sting org operation, takes him to Walmart, gives him $40, where he purchases machetes, and then as he leaves Walmart with the weapons, talking about how he's going to kill people at a, a New Year's Eve celebration, he's arrested and charged with material support for ISIS, even though, A, he didn't have any weapons, B, he didn't have any money to purchase weapons, and C, he didn't actually know anyone from ISIS. They're able to build a, a terrorism case against someone like this. And in the FBI's view, what they would say is that someone like Emmanuel Lutschman, left to his own devices, might one day meet a real terrorist operative who would provide him this opportunity. And so we are getting him off the street before the real terrorists get to them. That's a valid argument. There's never been a case quite like that, but it's, it's always possible, right? The, the, the secondary problem with this, in addition to this idea that maybe they are convicting people of terrorism charges who are incapable of terrorism on their own, is the, the public perception that is fueled by cases like this. Cases like Emmanuel Lutschman's or people who don't have capacity for terrorism or connection with terrorist groups, when they get involved in stings and they get busted, that becomes national news. And the headline is, you know, ISIS member caught in plot to bomb such and such building, right? And that fuels the perception that there is an, an enormous threat and, in fact, an exaggerated threat of terrorism from within Muslim communities. And in turn, that affects public policy. That affects how the FBI funds its programs counterterrorism program specifically focusing on on Muslims, as well as public support for things that are seen as corrective measures, such as Trump's travel ban, for example, right? The only reason that there is any public support for a travel ban like that is because there is a perception that Muslims are a danger uh, because of terrorism. And cases like this fuel a, 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 an exaggerated perception among the American public that uh, Muslims are um, extraordinarily more likely to get involved in terrorism than other groups, such as right-wing extremists, as an example. The number of informants jumped from 1,500 in 1975 to now over 15,000. A lot of these informants are criminals themselves, um, not actively criminals, but in some cases actual, still uh, behaving in criminal ways while they're being an informant. And that they're incentivized to go out and find these kinds of people because they'll get tens of thousands of dollars uh, if a case is made. And so how much is it? Uh, you said th that they met, but do they actively go out, these informants seeking people like this? Yeah. So to build on what you're describing here, um, post 9-11, there was this enormous increase in the number of informants or in the, the parlance of the FBI, what they call confidential human sources. And so I think when a lot of people think of the FBI and think of abuses in the FBI's history, they look back at J. Edgar Hoover and the um, COINTELPRO operations and their surveillance of civil rights groups. And it's important to keep in mind that during that time, J. Edgar Hoover had 1,500 informants, um, according to the Church Committee report. And, and what we know now is that the FBI now has 15,000, more than 10 times what it had under Hoover, um, due in large part to um, a classified directive at the time in 2006 from President George W. Bush telling the FBI to increase its informant numbers. And, and those informants can be used in a, in a variety of ways. I mean, among those 15,000 are people who are providing information to the FBI about crimes on Wall Street or drug crimes or public corruption. But because the FBI's number one priority is terrorism, the vast majority of these informants are in some capacity um, focused on counterterrorism. And, and for a lot of informants, especially those who are Muslim and assigned to Muslim communities, 
um, their priority is finding possible national security threats. That is, people who um, might pose a, a danger. Um, the, the problem, it, the, the underlying problem with a lot of this is that, you know, the informants that the FBI recruits are not necessarily law-abiding citizens like you and me or um, your neighbor. You know, none of us want to do an informant's work, right? Because being an informant is not the greatest job, right? You're going to spend months and months and months building a relationship with someone only to betray it later, to, to betray that person and send them to prison for months on end, um, excuse me, years on end. Um, that said, because being an informant and being a spy is not something most people want to do, um, the FBI um, has to resort to other means to recruit informants. And, and, you know, one example of how they recruit an informant would be, you know, how you've probably seen in movies, especially with the, the mafia war, how the FBI would go after and, you know, investigating a, a crime family would find a lower level operator who was maybe committing, you know, burglaries or car theft and they bust him and they say, okay, well, if you work with us, we can make this go away. Otherwise you're going to go to prison for a few years. And that tended to be in the drug war and in the, um, the mafia wars, how the FBI recruited informants today in counterterrorism. It's a, it's a lot more difficult because, um, you know, they're trying to recruit specifically from within Muslim communities. And while there are, criminals they can recruit, they're not going to be enough criminals from within this Muslim community to, to establish the numbers that they need. And so then, then they resort to things like immigration as leverage, finding people who might be deported and um, offering them relief from deportation if they become informants, or as is, as is quite common, um, the use of money. You know, informants can make, you know, tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars for every case that they bring in. And, and what that what that creates, and this is borne out in, you know, FBI documents and transcripts, is an incentive by the informant or incentive of the informant to find someone who could be dangerous. Right. So if you're an informant, you're sent out there. Maybe you're sent out there because you're looking for immigration relief. Maybe you're looking out there looking for money. Either way, there is an incentive for you to find someone who can be caught up in a counterterrorism sting, because that means you're going to get your special benefit, whether that's immigration relief, money, or both. And so when these informants go out, um, their hope is that they will find someone like the Boston Marathon bombers before they struck, or the Orlando shooter before he did what he did. But in most cases, they don't find that. In fact, there hasn't been a sting operation yet where the FBI informant or undercover agent found somebody who had a, you know, a big bomb and if it not if not for that sting operation would have used it um most of these people caught up in sting operations um might have a genesis of an idea like hey wouldn't it be great if we shot up a shopping mall but generally don't have guns generally don't have connections to international terrorists um you know and generally don't have money to acquire guns or weapons even if they if they had a contact to do so um and then secondly there are a number of cases where the defendants you know appear to have mental illness or have been diagnosed with mental illness, um, including a few that have had schizoaffective disorder, which means that they had trouble distinguishing between reality and fantasy, and um, that makes them easy prey for an informant. And so, so what happens in, in general then is you have these informants, 15,000 of, the, 15, of them sent around the country looking for would-be terrorists, and in the absence of finding the you know needle in the haystack, and, and keep in mind that even FBI director our former FBI director James Comey has described it as this, finding the needle in the haystack is what it's like to find a terrorist. Absent finding that needle, they're finding these people who can be kind of manipulated into these terrorism sting operations. Hey, do you, you know, do you want to get involved in this plot? I'm with ISIS. And these people, you know, they're not innocent. They say terrible things. They do stupid things. But none of these people were capable of terrorism on their own. And the reason these cases um, have become so prevalent is because there are incentives down the line. So, for example, you know, the FBI um, has its budget set by Congress. It's more than $3 billion a year for counterterrorism alone. And the FBI can't go back to Congress every year and say, hey, you know, we spent all this money on counterterrorism when we didn't find any terrorists. These sting operations and the defendants that they find provide a very concrete way for the FBI to say, hey, look at the cases that we've brought in. And so what happens then is the FBI incentivizes the case agents and the, the people running cases to say, you know, look, we need to build these terrorism cases. 
And that means promotions, that means raises. Those people then incentivize the informants who say, look, we need to find terrorism cases. You can make six figures if you find the right person. And then those people find the people who can then be caught up in sting operations. And, you know, despite this being kind of uh, a fairly easy thing to see as far as the perversion with which the FBI goes about finding terrorists, you know, so far the courts haven't pushed back. You know, we've seen an almost um, near perfect record of conviction on these types of cases. And so that's just further emboldened the FBI to do these type of cases and in turn further exaggerated the perception that, um, you know, Muslim terrorism is a near everyday threat in the United States when in fact, you know, if you look at real cases, the, the numbers uh, don't show that at all. And how much of this would you pin to, as you mentioned, uh, within the FBI itself or counterterrorism industry to profit uh, career mobility for uh, the government workers? And, uh, or, or do you see perhaps somewhere up the line, down the line, some ulterior motive behind the terror factory? So in, you know, the FBI not being here to defend itself, I mean, I, I think I want to articulate one part of this that it, that is in its defense and why they do these types of things. And what the FBI would say is that their hope is to create a hostile environment for terrorism. And this is also rooted in how the FBI prosecuted, uh, you know, investigations of the mafia or, or you know, the, or, or, or drug traffickers. And the idea is that by using informants and using sting operations and, and, and getting indictments and arrests, you create an environment where the people who are doing that type of illegal activity will always wonder like, hey, is this guy, you know, I'm working with next to me, is he maybe working for the feds? And in, in the FBI's view, this creates a general hostile environment for that type of activity, meaning that even as you're making arrests in some cases, you are on, on a global level making it more difficult for these organizations to commit their crimes. And so when applied to counterterrorism, the idea is that through these sting operations, they're not only getting off the pe people that, excuse me, getting off the street, people that they would view as dangerous, they're also creating kind of a warning for any real terrorists out there, like, hey, you know, you know, it's gonna be difficult for you to do what you're going to do because you're always gonna wonder if that guy next to you is working with us. And, and that's the general defense that the FBI um, uh, would articulate. Um, the, the difficulty is being able to measure how effective that is, right? I mean, you're kind of, it's almost impossible to know, you know, whether this type of strategy does have um, a, a make a market difference on the number of attacks because we simply can't measure attacks that might have happened that that never that never did. Um, but at the, at the same time, though, you know, I think there has been created within the FBI. Um, a number of incentives that make the FBI not really want to be self-reflective about this type of work and maybe the problems that they have with it. Um, you know, some, some, some quick history again would be, you know, prior to 9-11, you know, the FBI was very much the organization that, you know, investigated bank robberies and public corruption and Wall Street fraud. And, you know, counterterrorism and counterintelligence were, you know, departments that were not seen as the best places to be to rise up in the FBI. And so pre 9-11, if you were an ambitious agent and you wanted to rise up and, you know, get an office and a, and a better salary and work in headquarters, um, you went to public corruption or you went to organized crime. Um, post 9-11, that flipped and counterintelligence and counterterrorism became the places that ambitious agents wanted to go because that's where you moved up. Um, there also has been created um, a fairly lucrative industry and in security consulting around counterterrorism. And so you often see agents, instead of spending, um, you know, their entire careers at the FBI, as was kind of often the case pre 9-11, you have agents retiring after 10, 15 years and going into the, the private security industry because they can make a lot more money doing that given their resume with FBI counterterrorism. And, and part of that, and part of kind of securing that reputation of on counterterrorism and, and justifying its budgets is bringing in people who can be paraded as examples of, you know, terrorism plots thwarted. And I think that's the incentive that's created. And so, you know, certainly I think the FBI deserves the benefit of the doubt in the idea that this creates hostile environments for future terrorists. I also think there's plenty of reasons for self-examination by the FBI about whether these types of tactics are finding truly dangerous people and whether this is the best use of resources in, in, a, in a more general way for the agency. 
And could you tell us uh, just real quick about the creation uh, of your book? What was the process like? Uh, how time consuming was it? And did you suffer any great setbacks from the government or, or anyone else? So, um, you know, I didn't start writing the book until 2010, 2011, but this was a, a story that I, in a general way, was on since 2006, um, in that as a, as a reporter, I was seeing cases announced, um, you know, the most vivid for me and the one I describe in the book is the Liberty City 7 case in, in Miami, where an FBI informant, um, you know, got basically seven guys from the wrong side of the tracks who, you know, weren't even Muslim and, and caught them up in a sting operation by, you know, offering them money. And for, you know, a bunch of broke guys on the bad side of town of Miami, this was kind of change your life money. And so they went along in the supposed plot to bomb the Sears Tower and the FBI building in Miami. And the informant was saying, hey, I'm with Al Qaeda. You know, these guys didn't even really know what Al Qaeda was. Um, and I remember being at the press conference where this was announced and Alberto Gonzalez and the, uh, the U.S. Attorney General um, announced it with, with great you know, fanfare as if they'd stopped this really dangerous attack. And I remember thinking like what absurdity this was and, and wrote about it at the time and, and really kind of thought like this is just a one off. This is, you know, an absurdly bad case. And it turns out it wasn't. That was kind of a bellwether case. And what we've seen is a replication of the type of tactics used in that case, you know, over and over. And so um, in, in, in 2010, I got some funding from the University of California, Berkeley's investigative reporting program that gave me the time and, and resources to put together this database of cases that, that allowed us to kind of for the first time have a, a clear look at, you know, um, the number of terrorism prosecutions that had occurred and what terrorist group affiliations these groups were, were with and how many of them were truly dangerous, how many involved stings, you know, how many involved agent provocateurs. And, um, you, know, you know, the initial project and the data that's used in, in the book um, covers the first 10 years from 9-11 to roughly, you know, September um, 11th, 2011. And, you know, what's extraordinary is if you take, at that time, there were 508 defendants, you know, you can count, um, you know, on, on one hand, the number of dangerous ones who were there um, in that list. The, the vast majority were people caught up on immigration issues or, or financial crimes that the government alleged were related to terrorism. And then, of course, the really large cohort of people who, um, you know, were caught up in sting operations. And so, um, what I tried to do in my book is kind of describe the overview of these cases as well as the, um, you know, the history of the FBI and how we got here and the, and the problems associated with this. Um, you know, that said, you know, reporting on the FBI is, is always a challenge because in general it's, it's among the most secretive U.S. government agencies. You know, you can't exactly call up the press department and hey, say, hey, you know, hey, can I talk to the director today or can you hand me these documents? You know, it's, it's a very um, secretive organization for, you know, justifiable reasons. Um, you know, that said, I, I could not do my work without people within the FBI who, you know, help me explain things, either talking to me on the record or on background to, to make sure I understand how processes work. You know, these are, you know, agents who don't necessarily agree with the premise of a lot of my reporting, but, you know, are good enough to want to make sure that there's a full understanding of, of, of the issues. Um, and so I, I didn't run into any great roadblocks. I mean, I, I started writing it, you know, researching it, I should say, in, in, in earnest in, in 2010 and 2011 and 12. I wrote it and um, it came out in, in 2013. So it was a fairly quick process for a book. I, I say that being a little naive in that, that this was my first and only book so far. Um, but, you know, what we tried to do was, was uh, you know, turn it around fairly quickly because we felt it was, uh, you know, the information was, was, was particularly timely and kind of something that was, you know, ever evolving. And could you just, uh, we'll just look at one recent example, you know, yesterday I found, you know, on Russia Today, one example, and then from the Milwaukee, a local Milwaukee paper, another example, which I, which I sent you of this guy who apparently FBI informants had been, um, he wanted to buy a gun apparently just for self-defense, and they kept pressuring him to carry out a mass shooting. Um, actually, his hearing, he's got a hearing today. Um, and it says he has no criminal record, solid work history, and a job waiting for him, a family who supports him. And this kind of seems like right straight out of your book, classical entrapment case. Uh, I don't know if you can comment on, on this Milwaukee story. Yeah, I mean, with the, the government has treated the Milwaukee case like, um, uh, like a terrorism case, as a terrorism case. I mean, some of the new revelations that came up in the lawyer's filing that the, the story you pointed to 
um, discusses. I mean, it was unusual in the sense that this was a guy who said, yeah, I just want a gun for self-protection, and the informants pushed him along, right? And so, again, this gets at the incentives. These informants are going to make money if this guy becomes a prosecutable um, you know, target. And so they have a direct incentive in, in, in pushing him along versus, you know, saying, like, oh, he just wants his own gun, no big deal, let's go find someone else, right? They've already got time invested in this guy, so they, they want to string him along in some way. But what's, what's really interesting about that case is that, you know, he, instead of getting involved in a plot for, with ISIS, um, this was a guy who apparently was led on by the informants to believe that the, the Masons, this, you know, this, this order, this basically a club in the United States, um, were affiliated with, with ISIS and that they were involved in all sorts of violence. And, you know, the Masons are a group that people have all kinds of conspiracy theories about, but this is, you know, this is a new one. And, uh, you know, this guy was naive enough and, you know, I hate to be pejorative, but, you know, dumb enough to kind of believe this, right? And he then gets involved in this plot to attack the Masons, believing that they're, you know, ISIS and, you know, are against his own religious beliefs as a devout Muslim, and they charge him with terrorism, right? Would he ever have done that were it not for the informants? And in all likelihood, no, right? And that's what his lawyers are, are arguing. Um, but that's the methods that you see there, even though this was a weird case in the sense that he seemed to be fighting ISIS rather than, you know, supporting it. You know, the methods that you see there are common, you know, th throughout. And, you know, the FBI kind of constantly pushing people to go through with these things. Um, you know, there was a case in, in South Florida where, you know, like the case I mentioned earlier, where there was a homeless mentally ill man, there was another homeless mentally ill man in South Florida. And he had this history of, um, you know, making these baseless threats, including to family members. He'd call up family members and, and you know, say he was going to kill them. And of course, he was just, you know, he's mentally ill he's, and he probably needed help. Um, Instead, he meets an FBI informant and the FBI informant says, well, you know, you want to bomb something? Let's go. Let's go bomb uh, this building and we'll we'll claim credit for ISIS. And, you know, so the actual in that case, the actual idea of crediting the violence to a terrorist organization came from the informant himself. And because the person went along with it, um, the FBI then prosecutes this person, excuse me, the Department of Justice then prosecutes this person based on the FBI sting as an ISIS case. And again, then this, this, this creates the perception that another kind of ISIS case thwarted. Um, and, and I think, you know, these are becoming, you know, all the more common. And I think, you know, a lot of things I, when I give talks, I mean, one of the things I, I encourage people to, to do is just be generally skeptical about the announcement of terrorism prosecutions. Um, you know, and they're usually pretty easy to spot when it's a sting involving someone who's, you know, capacity for violence was was questionable. You know, there's never a clear link to an international terrorist group. The person generally doesn't have any weapons or money. And um, there is always an undercover FBI agent or an informant who plays a central role in, in pushing the case forward. And if you can just add to that, that was my next question. Since your book came out in 2013, it's now four years later, 2017. Um, are there any real new developments uh, related to the terror factory? You, you, you're saying now it's an everyday occurrence. Um, is it happening more and more? The money keeps flowing for counterterrorism? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. You know, in, in my own work, one of the things I've done now at The Intercept is we've created this, this database called Trial and Terror that we are updating. It also includes a series of stories. And so the database of cases now um, so originally for my book, I used the 10 years of data from 9-11 to September 2011. Um, we're now kind of keeping these data sets up to date. Um, and so if, if anyone's interested, you can go to theintercept.com and then there's a, you'll see a banner for the trial and terror database. And that will allow you to look not only at the raw data, pull up cases, you know, sort through defendants from, from particular states, but then you can also kind of get a bigger sense of what the data means through, um, you know, through the data visualizations. Um, but that said, you know, it's, it's amazing how fast things have changed. So my book was published four years ago. Um, you know, ISIS really wasn't an organization that existed four years ago, not in any meaningful way. And, you know, one of the things we're seeing is how the FBI has applied the tactics that it's used pre-ISIS to now ISIS defendants. And um, we're releasing a new edition of the book next year, in March of next year, that, that'll address some of these issues and include material about, about ISIS cases. But what's interesting is that, you know, there have now been more than 100 ISIS defendants in the United States in domestic terrorism, excuse me, uh, international terrorism prosecutions that have occurred in the U.S. 
And, you know, the vast majority of these were not people who were connected to international terrorist groups. And in fact, you can see just looking at the data that the FBI has taken an even more aggressive stance going after ISIS cases than it had ever had under, under Al Qaeda. And you're also seeing like really creative prosecutions and questionable prosecutions. You know, so for example, you're, we're now seeing more and more, um, you know, prosecutions for material support for people who aren't involved in violence, don't have direct contacts with ISIS, but are, for example, running Twitter accounts that distribute ISIS propaganda, or are, you know, in one case, a guy, you know, gave lessons to someone who was interested in traveling to Syria on how to use Bitcoin so as to avoid currency um, transaction rules and be able to get basically his money into Syria. Um, these are the types of things that we weren't seeing under, under um, the DOJ with Al Qaeda prosecutions. And then we're also seeing the use of the internet being the, the, the most frequent place that the FBI is finding targets of investigations or would be terrorists in their view. Um, so, you know, go back 10 years and, and the, the kind of scope of these cases and the, the template of these cases, I should say, um, usually involved an informant going into a mosque or another kind of a business maybe and finding someone who was interested in terrorism. Today, the informant and the undercover agent are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, and they're looking for people who are espousing, um, in their view, radical beliefs or empathy or support for ISIS in some way. And then they're then contacting them, and that's how the sting is starting. Um, the, the question is, like, if you go online and, you know, pose, you know if, if you're online, you know, posting ISIS propaganda and saying you're interested in joining ISIS, there's a real chance that you're going to maybe meet like a real ISIS guy and he's going to try to help you come to Syria or maybe help you get involved in a, in a plot, right? But there's a much, much, much greater chance that the person you're actually going to be talking to is an FBI informant or undercover agent. And so then that, that raises the kind of a, a, another question that's similar to the others, which is, you know, in the absence of these FBI informants and undercover agents trolling the internet and you know, encouraging people to get involved in, in ISIS, how many like real people would be out there affiliated with ISIS, you know, socializing on social media? Because the truth is like, you know, the social media platforms have done a really great job of the whack-a-mole game of getting rid of, you know, terrorist groups that start posting videos and, and propaganda. I mean, YouTube and Facebook and Twitter have all gotten really good at this. And so unless you're a very sophisticated you know, user who can go on the dark web and go on some forum and meet ISIS people, going on Facebook is likely not going to be a very good way of becoming a terrorist. But it is a great way to get yourself up in a, you know, terrorism sting operation. And so, you know, the vast majority of these cases, they don't have the capacity. But then there's this other question of like, well, they didn't even have the sophistication to understand that like going on Facebook and, and claiming to be, you know, down with ISIS is is a really bad idea, bad way of actually joining the organization, um, and so that, I think that's where you're seeing kind of the evolution of the sting further into you know kind of the more online world that ISIS is inhabited in a much more sophisticated and you know social media way than um, than Al Qaeda ever did. And one final uh, question: um, Do you see where do you see this going? Do you, do you see things getting better? Or in terms of you know surveillance, privacy, civil liberties, do you see this expanding to become more draconian um, and maybe later not targeting just Muslims, but you know Christians or, or everyday citizens um, who aren't necessarily involved uh, in extremism? Where, where do you see this all, all all going? Yeah, I mean, I think I think these were controversial policies under George W. Bush and under Barack Obama. And I think there was, among a lot of people, this perception like, well, you know, maybe these are, are strong handed tactics, but these are extraordinary times and we can trust, you know, the Bush and the Obama administrations to, to, to deal with this in, in the right ethical way. Um, I think there are a lot of questions now about, you know, whether these extraordinary powers that the FBI and other law enforcement agencies have acquired post 9-11 are in ethical and capable hands under um, the Obama, or excuse me, under the Trump administration. And I, I think there's a number of things to worry about. I mean, A, I think obviously you're going to see an increased use of these tactics in Muslim communities and probably an aggressive use of them given the you know, generally Islamophobic nature of the Trump administration. Um, 
But I also think, B, that there is going to be an application of some of the more draconian tactics that have been refined during the war on terror um, to other people, and, and maybe not even related to terrorism charges, to non-Muslims, not even related to terrorism charges, I should say. And, and we've even seen a hint of that. So one of the things that Attorney General Jeff Sessions has, has specifically ordered the Department of Justice to pursue is the, in every case, the, the most significant possible charge possible for any indictment. And what that means is, you know, in, in any investigation, because of the voluminous number of charges available to federal prosecutors, there's often multiple choices to make when, when charging someone. And so depending on the seriousness of the crime, there's a fair amount of prosecutorial discretion about the charges that would come. And so, you know, obviously anytime you're indicted on, on charges, those initial charges set the table, whether it's a, a, you're gonna plea it down later or, or take it to trial. And what we see in, in terrorism prosecutions, for example, and, and why this is so significant, and in some ways I would argue um, concerning, is that what you see in terrorism prosecutions is that there are a number of crimes that include what are called mandatory minimum sentences, which means that if the person takes this to trial and is convicted, the judge is largely um, you know, bound to sentence that person to the mandatory minimum sentence. And, and the initial idea of mandatory minimum sentences was to take away um, what had been discrepancies throughout the federal system where, you know, one person charged with one crime was was given, you know, X number of years and someone in another district charged with the same crime was given so many more. In practice, um, excuse me, in theory, um, mandatory minimum sentences are supposed to alleviate that problem. In practice, especially with terrorism cases, it creates um, hugely draconian sentences for people who probably didn't, didn't get involved in crimes that deserve it. So an example of this would be, if you are involved in a crime that involves a surface to air missile, um, that qualifies you for a mandatory minimum sentence of 30 years in prison. And so what we see in counterterrorism sting operations in particular is the deliberate introduction in the sting of surface to air missiles, because the FBI and the Department of Justice know that by inserting this into the sting, and of course the FBI is the one that provides the weapons in these stings, so it has the you know, ability to kind of abracadabra, here's the surface to air missile. And so then the target of the investigation by accepting this and then ultimately getting indicted puts themselves in a position where they're gonna face a 30 year mandatory minimum sentence if they take this to trial. And that creates an incentive for them to plead it down, right? It creates an efficiency for the Department of Justice because they'll happily plead this guy down and give him 12 years in prison. And, and what, what Sessions, I suspect, wants to do is, is more of that type of behavior across the board in all cases to basically you know, make the, the boot heel of the government kind of even stronger and heavier for average people because they will, if they choose to fight the case, will, will be in a position where they will you know, face years more in jail than they probably would have given previous eras of, of prosecutorial discretion. And I think that's what we really need to be concerned about. And I think you know, I mean, one of the things I always mention to people in, in, in talks and, 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 and discussions like this is that, you know, the issue might seem distant, right? Like maybe you're not a Muslim, you know, you're not in a situation where you're going to get caught up in a sting, you know, it is scary times, you know, what does this all mean? And I think it's easy to be like, this doesn't affect me. But the truth is that, you know, throughout history, governments have shown that they're, um, you, they will take some of the most abusive policies and apply them to marginalized groups. And when the rest of the population doesn't speak up and, and protest this, those types of tactics are then applied kind of across the board. And, you know, to some extent, we can see this with surveillance, right? Like we, we've allowed the government to um, have this extraordinary power to, you know, kind of literally um, be able to capture all of our, um, all of our kind of communications, you know, such that, you know, my wife and I, for example, use signal, right? Not because we're doing anything wrong, but we just think it's creepy that, you know, the, the government can listen into our communications and, and text messages and see them. And so, you know, in, in the zeal for kind of counterterrorism, we've allowed the government these extraordinary powers. And, you know, that's going to have an enormous chilling effect. You know, it has an enormous chilling effect on what people talk about, on, on how they view the government. And, and I think we're already beginning to see kind of these, these kind of questions emerge. And I think, you know, the Trump administration, given that, you know, the president has advocated torture and seemed to be, um, you know, in some cases supportive of surveillance and with an attorney general who has, you know, largely, uh, you know, come down as a, you know, anti-marijuana war on 
drugs, you know, law and order politician. You know, I think this is a concerning time for how the the U.S. government will use these powers um, that were given to them with the right intention, right? Like, I think we can all agree that we should stop terrorists, but you know, because of the nature of government and because of the nature of South national security, you know, we've seen um, an application of these powers um, and a growth of them uh, that I don't think anyone anticipated, and I think people should be paying a lot more attention to. All right, and your website is trevoraronson.com. Your Twitter is also the same, Trevor Aronson. People can find your TED Talk through your website, uh, the link to your book, uh, your articles on Intercept. And so how are the best ways people can follow you, support your work, uh, or, or donate to your uh, organization? Yeah, so um, you can find me on most social media just as Trevor Aronson. Um, and then I, um, I work through the Florida Center for Investigative Reporting, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. And uh, we uh, are funded from, through foundations and individual giving. So you can find more information about that at fcir.org. And then you can contact me. And if you have any, any questions or want more information about me, as you said, my, my website's probably the best place. It's just trevoraronson.com.